it is, first of all, a pleasure and an honor for both of us to be able to sit and chat with you quietly about lots of things. And when I think about you, now that I have an opportunity to see you across the table, most of the time when I see you these days, it's in Ruth Mandel's office. I go over to Ruth Mandel's <laughs> office, and she has, of course, photographs and buttons and everything all over the place. But in a very special place, and I understand it was a birthday present, in August of one year for her birthday, she got a collage picture of you. In fact, there are three pictures of you because you were on the cover of the three national magazines that summer. Even more than that. <laughs> I'll bet you were. Well, they managed to get three of them for so this they birthday. Gave me a small present, huh? Uh, <laughs> no, no, I, have, I have all the others. I can let you see those. Oh, right? good. Well, I can't exactly ask what does it like, what does it feel like to be a national icon, but there are, I'm sure, upsides of that as well as downsides. And you've described both of them uh, in earlier versions of your life, this wonderful biography of that particular experience. But now, in 2002, looking back, what would you say about both the upsides and the downsides of that experience? You know, it's kind of like um, if, you've had, if you've had something horrible happen to you, you kind of forget the pain. And you mm -hmm. only remember the good. I mean, when I when I put things, I, I've had friends of mine who have gone through, you know, face lifts and things mm -hmm. like that. And they they've talked about, you know, God, when you come out, the pain is unbelievable. And then afterwards, you know, after a couple of months, mm -hmm. they forget the pain. Uh, they looked great, and, mm -hmm. it, and that's all they remember. And it's the same thing with having a child. Sometimes, I mean, in the olden days, I mean, you go in, you say, ah. Oh, you know, just give me a shot so I don't, I can forget the pain. Um, and then you have this beautiful, magnificent baby. Well, it's the same thing with the campaign. Um, there were times during the campaign when I would turn around and say, oh, God, if only this thing would get over with. Because there were so many unpleasant parts of that campaign. Mm -hmm. Most of them had to do with the media's attack on me, um, with my own church's attack mm -hmm. on me. And I just wanted it over from that viewpoint. Uh, but the flip side of it was there were so many good parts of that campaign, the traveling around the country, the response of the people, the, the recognition that we were changing things in this country once and for all. You know, that women would become serious national candidates. Uh, for office, and and so the good parts are the parts that I kind of remember and have held on to, mm -hmm. and and those have been wonderful, wonderful parts to to look back on. Um, I was at an event yesterday, an Italian American event, and a young reporter who is an honoree. I was an honoree, and as was he. He was talking about the fact that he was in at the University um, in, of Indiana, I guess it was, in uh, 84. And he said he had, when I got the nomination, he was watching this on television, and he said a Japanese-American friend of his walked in and said, well, I guess, I guess you guys now have one of your own in there. And he said, you know, I had never identified as an Italian-American before. He said, even though my family was. And he said, and now he said, I really do celebrate my heritage, which I thought was an incredible way yeah. of dealing uh -huh. with this. I had never heard it uh, from the ethnicity uh, aspect. I hear that from women, and I hear till today mm -hmm. the impact that that campaign had on their lives. So, you know, it's, I, it's all the good stuff mm -hmm. that is important. The negative stuff, um, I'm glad that that is over, and um, because I, it's the type of thing that it, it was all political. Uh, it came up during the course of the campaign, and it ended at the end of the campaign. And I just hope that we've made a difference again for Italian Americans running for office, and um, and for Catholics who are pro-choice running for office. Mm -hmm. Does um, it? Uh, when I hear you saying that, uh, and of course you. Uh, 
there were moments during that campaign when everyone knew how brave you were and what you had to confront and challenge. And I keep thinking of, remember that ad? It was, I don't remember if it was about that time, but it was about 20 years ago. There was a series, I think it was for mink coats or something, and they would have Lillian Hellman and these other women wearing them. And, and the line was, what becomes a legend most? Yeah. Do you remember those? Yeah. Oh, they're and, still running some of those. Are they running yeah, those still? still? I, I think of them. you, I think, what becomes a legend? <laughs> I mean, you are a legend, and it's true what you're just describing now. I mean, the contribution to U.S political history, women's the, the opportunities for women, Italian-Americans, um, all of those, I mean, you can, th you can know that you've done that. On the other hand, when I think about that campaign, I think the personal cost, um, not just during the campaign, but after. I mean, I think it cost yeah. you a lot in, in the career that you were developing as well. Yeah, I, I would have loved it if New York State had been as, as progressive as Texas or as Connecticut. I mean, in both of those instances, Lloyd Benson was able to run for vice president and still run for the Senate at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Lieberman was able to run for um, both the Senate for re-election and mm -hmm. for vice president. New York doesn't have that. So what happened when I got the nomination, in fact, right before it, when they talked to me about the, the night before and they said, you know you were going to have to give up your congressional seat. I knew why I, I did, because I could not run for re-election to my congressional seat and uh, accept the nomination for vice president. I would have loved to have been able to remain in the Congress. I would have been delighted to have input into the issues. Right. But you know what, Ruth, there are a lot of benefits that have come out of this, too. Um, my children uh, are, I mean, they've all succeeded. They were, they were just, they were young adults. One, mm -hmm. Laura just turned 18. Uh, John was 20, uh, Donna was 22. I look at them now, these are three professionals. Um, they, are, they are family people. We are so close. And I, I credit that in large measure to not only the campaign itself, because my kids got very involved in the campaign, but for, I credit that to some of the tough times because my kids, hmm. my kids kind of Circle. literally yes. and figuratively uh -huh. put their arms around us and and they have not let those arms go mm. for you know 18 years and it's amazing how when anything comes up that is not easy and in one instance this is my diagnosis right you know a couple of years three and a half years ago when that happened my children kind of circled oh. again and it's fascinating to watch. So that was a benefit that I got out of that. Um, I also, I must say, I'm also in a position where if I speak up, I can make a difference for things. I had an opportunity mm -hmm. because of President Clinton to serve in Geneva at the Human Rights Commission. Everybody knew who I was when mm -hmm. I walked in there. I wasn't in, in public office, but there wasn't one representative of any of the countries who didn't know who I was. And, you know, I was important because I was the United States. But it was also nice that they had someone that they, they kind of knew. Mm -hmm. And it got me, I mean, it gave me credibility right off the bat. So that was, you know, those are some of the benefits that came out of it. You can't really quantify. And, uh, you know, it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. So if you were, if you were giving them... Um and I'm not meaning this to be the message or anything, but we think all the time, especially Mary and I interacting with students all the time, and I'm sure you do too, because I know you speak to young women right. around on college campuses, uh, you, would tell, you would tell them it's worth it. Go oh, to it absolutely. and do it. absolutely. You would. You know, that with any of the things that, that happen in life, I mean, you, you've, got to, you've got to figure out what your main goal is, first of all. And, and when, when we looked, our goal was to get elected, obviously. <laughs> um, but it was also, I mean, if you take a look at w the discussions that Fritz and I had before, that, mm -hmm. that we had during the campaign, and that we've had, you know, even recently, it's, it's getting rid of that door that was hung, that sign that was hung on the door of the White House that said, men only. And, you know, white men only. Um, we did make a difference. We opened that door for women. I think the Reverend Jesse Jackson opened the door for 
African Americans. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that once those doors are opened, you know, who's going to say that we're going to slam them shut again? So let me ask you a question. If they're open, why, and I'm not going to sound down about everything today, but right. let me get this one. This one, this one I want to get off my chest, really, and I, want, and I want your perspective on it. If they're open, why aren't women, more women, coming through them? I just want to give you um, two, two recent statistics. One is we've just finished a study of women in state legislatures after 10 years looking at the late uh, 1980s and the end of the 20th century, the age of women in legislatures is not going down, it's going up. That's one thing that we found that strikes me as perplexing is it and because troublesome. more women are running for office than when they're older? Well, the numbers aren't going up that much. The numbers are pretty much but level and not tipping a little bit. It's true, is a big it's true. Thing. But I want to know well, let me give you the other okay. figure, and then, so that's one thing we've noticed. The age is going up. The other is that um, another project that I'm involved with is giving us the opportunity to identify young elected officials around the country, age 35 and under, men and women, to find out who's there at the beginning of the 21st century in various levels of office. Who's there? And we're just in that process, so I can't give you finals yet. Right. But I can tell you that in the Congress of the United States, in this session, there are six people 35 or younger. They're all male. Um, they're white male. Uh, in state legislatures, so far, uh, I think we're finding a little over 300, 35 and under. Um, maybe 10% of them are female. But you know what? I, that doesn't bother we're me. What? Well, it's They're not for coming one, through the doors. Well, you know, they are coming through the doors. I mean, I think a better statistic is, is the number of women who are in the Congress now compared to what they were in 1984. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it, a better number is the number of women in the United States Senate. In 1984, you know that it was only Nancy Kassenbaum. And, you know, uh, we now, we've got 13. I mean, it's just, it's wonderful to see what's Big happening. Mm -hmm. and, and remember that incumbency is to me the biggest problem to keeping people out of office, male or female, new, mm -hmm. coming in, and most of the incumbents are white males. But um, I, it doesn't surprise me that women who are, mm -hmm. who are under 35 are not, are not running as frequently. A lot of them are trying to, to move into a professional uh, career and are not choosing politics. Um, a lot of them are going into, are wanting to have kids. And, and it, it's very hard, I think, to be in office and do both. Part of it is because a, an elective office is not like a job. It's just not an ordinary job. You go to work or I come to work here, and I, I come in if I want to come in at 9 or I come in at 10, mm -hmm. and when I leave at the end of the day, I'm finished. I don't have to work weekends. I don't have to work at night. If I want to go out to dinner, I do. There isn't a member of Congress who can say that, not one, male or female. There isn't a male or female member of Congress who can say, you know, I just want to take off. I don't feel like going to that, um, you know, my kids are off on, on spring break now and I want to go down to Disney World for a week with them. Uh -huh. Well, you know, if you do that, you know, what about all those things that you have to do? I mean, if you're on a committee that has to go look at the Middle East, I mean, do you go to, to Disney World while this is all going on or do you go to the Middle East? Um, they don't have control of their lives. And I have to tell you that if my children were young when I ran for Congress the first time, I would mm -hmm. not have run. And if I lived in California when I ran for Congress, I would not have run because for me, I was a shuttle flight away. Mm -hmm. My youngest was 12, and I have to tell you, she did resent my going. Um, <laughs> the, but I would go down on Tuesday morning, come back on Thursday night because I was in New York. Yeah. And then weekends, my husband and I would go to five and six events. Our kids were teenagers. I mean, our kids, we, I mean, they would, they would turn around. And I used to say that they were, they were the luckiest kids in, 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 
you're, you're luckiest teenagers in, in the country, mm -hmm. that they had worked so hard on my campaign because they figured that was a great way to get rid of their mother for at least <laughs> part of the week. But, but it's, it is a very difficult position for a young woman, a young woman who wants family to be in. Um, but it's because it's, it's in a very unusual job. Men who are under 35 who are married don't have those same problems because their wives are the ones who will but be with the kids. that hasn't changed. No, it doesn't. It doesn't change till today. I mean, with any of us, uh, you know, we, we do the things that, that parents and grandparents do no matter what you're, you know, mm -hmm. and what, you may be big deal with, with other people, but, you know, you're still mom, you're still gammy, you're still, you know, you're the person, I, I really need you, do you think you could come over and babysit for me, I have to go over and do something? Sure. You know, it's that type of thing. Well, I think it really is beginning to change, but I think you're absolutely right that it's still very much there, and also that the young men still perceive that they can get away with this kind of thing, whereas young women don't. In fact, they don't want to more than the yeah. young men. So we're still in that situation. But another thing Except that we're Dr. noticing... Jason Chuck, there are yes? lots of young men who are, who are quitting the Congress yes. and who are saying, I, won't, I don't want to do this. Uh -huh. I want to spend more time with my kids. And, and when that begins to happen, is the institution itself going to change? Are some of these expectations that it's a kind of 24-hour job going to change? No. No, because it's not the institution that's putting it on. It's the politics that does. In order to get, and it's the people uh -huh. who expect it. I mean, you know, if you're a member of Congress, you have to go back to the voters in your district every two years. And people are very demanding. Um, they want you to know everything that's going on in Washington. They want you to vote in their interest only. Forget what's happening in the yeah. rest of the country. Uh, you know, they, they're interested in what they're interested in. And, and you've, got to, you've got to be able to, if you don't always vote the way they want, I mean, you have to go in and you have to spend a lot of time explaining why you don't. And, um, and then you end up with, you know, if they do an event, if they have... If they have, you know, something, it's important in the lives of, you know, maybe 30 people, um, and they don't understand that you may be representing 500,000, they want you at their there. events. Mm -hmm. And, gee, do we every, only see you every two years? Uh, well, you know, I've got like 40 different organizations that are just like yours that are doing events every year. I can't come every year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and so it's... It's really Although, hard. Just as you were suggesting earlier that young women are choosing professions now in larger numbers, talented young women that aren't politics. And I have to confess that the women that Ruth and I have been interviewing, yourself included, seem to us a kind of group of super women in a way because you've been able to deal with all of these situations and at the same time, yes, you've talked about some of the compromises, but basically you have given 150 percent. Yeah, but you know what? I, I always tell young people, please, don't really believe we're super. We're not. We're not. We're just as human as anybody else. The, the, I, was, I locked out. I told you my children were older. Um, but in addition to that, I had a housekeeper mm -hmm. who did everything that a wife would do. She was, she was early, there early in the morning. She was there through dinner. She did all the washing, ironing, the housekeeping, the cleaning. I, she didn't go to the school and talk to the teachers. We did that. She mm -hmm. didn't, she wasn't, I mean, if they were sick and they were home, I was in touch with the doctor and all the rest of that stuff, but she was there to make the tea or the whatever, the juice and give them the soups and stuff like that. She was wonderful. But, you know, so I cheated. And, and <laughs> she kept the house really nice. Now, I say to people, if you can't afford that, that's fine too, but just then prioritize. Um, you know, you've got to figure that mm -hmm. if the house isn't totally spotless, hello, who cares? I mean, that's not, should not be on the top of your priority list. If, you, if you're worried that you don't like to iron, mm -hmm. and I have, that's, that's something I like to do, by the way, um, then, you know, wash and wear is big. 
and dry cleaners are fabulous to getting things done. You know, there are ways to get by these things, but don't think you have to be perfect wife, perfect mother, perfect housekeeper, perfect laundress, perfect cook. I mean, you can't do it. That's the superwoman. I was not that. And I don't think you're going to find many women who are. Well, another part that I think creates some problems for the younger generation is that they're aware of what happens on television, and they are aware of the conflict and the kinds of things that you've described. And they say, who wants to buy into that when I can go into a professional career that I don't have to answer people every day, and I don't have to take the slings and arrows of all of that stuff that politicians have to deal with? Is there any hope that the climate can be changed, that we can educate uh, more American voters that this is really not fair to their elected representatives? Or do you, you think know, that's just going to be that way? It's going to be that way because people will say, if you don't like it, don't, don't do it. This is a voluntary position. Nobody's forcing you to run for office. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's, it's changed. I, the person who represented my district before I was elected in 78 was somebody by the name of Jim Delaney. Very powerful man. Uh, in the Congress for something like 42 mm -hmm. years and very conservative. Um, when, when I, he, he decided not to run for re-election because for the first time he had a challenge coming from the right. It was this Al Delavovian assemblyman. And the district was very much a district that um, was conservative and so his, he used to get Republican, conservative, and Democratic endorsement. He never had an election, never had to spend a dime. And he was rules chairman. He certainly could have raised money. Mm -hmm. He decided not to run because, to be quite frank, I think he would have been beaten. And um, when he pulled out, I went in. When I got elected, I looked to see how much mail he had. And I actually had hired, because I knew nothing about the Congress, I hired somebody who was his, his uh, chief mm -hmm. of staff and kept him on with myself and I said okay so the mail that comes in now I will deal with when I get it and there was like maybe 13 letters a week and I said to him what is with this why isn't there any mail and he said well Jim used to have a fabulous way of dealing with the mail and I said what was that he said I said didn't he answer he said no he used to read it and I said what is this person bothering me for and he'd rip it up and throw it in the garbage uh, or, you know, scrumple it up and throw it in the car. And, I mean, I became crazed about that because I said, how do you do Computers, no computer. Uh -huh. I mean, he did not want any of that mm -hmm. stuff. Everything was kind of old. Um, he never came into the district. His, uh, he had an apartment someplace, um, but his, his, he used to also have a place down in Florida. I forgot where it was, Boca Raton or someplace down in Florida. So his traveling from Washington was Washington to Florida. It was never Washington to Woodside or Sunnyside. And the district office was on a side street in Forest Hills that we could not find. Now, the difference was, and it was one of the first things that they did when we first got elected, they have, they have this kind of um, meeting for new members, and they have some of the older members come through. And Tom Downey was one of the older members at that time. Of course, he was like 15 years younger than all the rest of us. <laughs> but he, he had been elected in a very Republican district, and he had won the second time round, really, uh, with big numbers. And he said, what you've got to do is make sure that your constituents know you. Um, and, I mean, he said, you've got two jobs. One is your district office job, that's the one that gets you elected. The one down here is where you do the good for the district and the country. But he said the one there, without the one there, nothing's going to happen. And so he had a van that in one of these moving, mobile offices, and he had it out in the island where they had a lot of distance between offices. I had one office in the center of my district, and I, I rented a mobile uh, office that I used to bring to different parts of my district so that my people did not have to come into my office. I used to say to them, you don't have to come. If you have a problem, call us. And I would have all the people ready, you know, uh, each with a specialty to handle all the problems in my district. And I welcomed mail. I loved getting mail. 
And um, we did town hall meetings. We did all of those things that was, you know, it, it was important for the district, it was important for re-election. That changed, but that will never go back to the way it was under Jim Delaney. Mm -hmm. Never. And also because uh, these days you can't decide not to have a computer probably, right? Or, no, absolutely you know, deal with not. No. Like, so they know they can get to you. And absolutely. Did you, um, you know, you belong in the pantheon of leaders, right? Uh, no question about that. Uh, that w you will always be in history as one of the major leaders, American women leaders. Did you learn leadership anywhere? Do you think of yourself as a leader? Can we teach young women leadership? We can open the door, as you've pointed out. They can use it or not choose to use it at whatever stage of life works for them. Um, but when I say to you, you're a leader, what do you think? What you know, I've, I actually have been thinking about because I have. Look. <laughs> well, I've been thinking about that because, because I'm, I'm doing an event uh, next week, and someone asked me, um, to talk a little bit about that. And, you know, I started thinking back to when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And and I guess part of it, I don't, it's amazing how things have an impact on your life, and I'm not, you know, my father died when I was eight. And I think part of, I think if he had not died, I probably would have been very spoiled because he, I mean, I was his baby and uh -huh. I was his princess and, you know, anything I wanted I got. But I, I had to work very hard after that uh, for everything. My mother told me that I could have whatever I wanted. I could be whatever I wanted to be, mm -hmm. but I had to work for it. I, because we couldn't afford it. I mean, my, after my father died, things were very, very tough. And, um, and my mother was a crochet beater. She, she worked harder than anybody. Uh, and without her leadership, I would never have gotten to where I am. But, but she taught me by her example, I think, how to lead. She, she taught me um, to strive for the things that I think are important. And she told, taught me also to not focus on things that you can't change, to move where you can make a difference and, and move where you can accomplish things. Um, she did that with her own lives life and and um, and she was not an educated woman she had mm -hmm. she had had to quit school when she finished eighth grade in order to help support brothers and sisters younger brothers and sisters after her father had a stroke so it was I think her example but uh, from the time I was in high school I mean I was put in a position where when the school was split into two teams for sports I wasn't the best athlete in the school, um, but I was chosen to captain the school, mm -hmm. the white team, <laughs> for the school, and we won. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I moved into leadership positions on newspaper, the newspaper, the school newspaper, in both high school and college, uh, leadership position on the yearbook. Um, in the, in the law that, school. How do you account for that? Uh, because I wanted, I wanted to get something done, and so in order and to do, do it, that. yeah, mm -hmm. and and I wanted to do it to make sure it was done. And I think people people see that, um, you know, in law school the same thing. I I ran for uh, you know the student bar association. I ran for president. I ran for secretary, which was a position. That and, and you can't say it was a position that women held because there were only two women in, oh. <laughs> in my class. You know, it wasn't. But I, I wanted to be in in the leadership of the bar association, and I knew that as a woman it would be very hard to do. But I also knew that as a night student it would be very hard to do, and you know, to run for president. So I ran for a job. I mean, I think you also have to know you know, what you can accomplish. And so you move out and try to do it. But but I've I've enjoyed I think part of it is is I if I see a need to get something done, um, I wanna get it done and I wanna do it. And uh, I put myself in that position. Mm -hmm. and, so in uh, some combination as you're describing it of an, a, a very important example, your mother and I know you 
often talked about are clearly she was such an important force in your life and a personality that you brought to it of going making sure that what needed to get done you were you were going to tackle at least yeah. achieve it or not you were going to tackle it it's that because you know we're perplexed all the time with how how to approach this if we think about teaching you know teaching leadership i'm always a bit well, skeptical about you, that you've I also got to teach you know. you've, you've also got to teach young people that it's okay to fail um, you learn from failure. I mean, I, I, I don't. I don't recommend it. I mean, I mean, that's not. You go. Don't go into something because you want to. You you don't want to win. I mean, if you if you're a leader, you want to. You want to win. But if it doesn't happen, you know, get up and move on, and try again. I mean, you know, that's that's important to do. The second thing I think you have to teach them, among the second things, there are lots of second things, <laughs> is that you've got to be willing to take a risk. Yeah. You know. Yes, I think, and here I am, I direct something called the Institute for Women's Leadership, and I ask myself the same kinds of questions. What, what are we up to here? Can we really do this? And what are, what are the things we can do well? And where do we have to just stand back and acknowledge, you know, not everybody is leadership material, as it were. But lots more, I think, are than even think they are. And it's with that particular mix we want to play a bit and we do have a project in which young women have to set out a leadership activity and carry it through but as you were saying they don't have to succeed we told them it's all right if you fail we had a young woman who tried to organize women in a local housing project she failed and she got up and talked about her failure and how she was going to go back and do it differently next time. That's so if those lessons can be learned when they're still I think kids, you know, it makes such a difference later on, I think. But let, let me just stop you for a yes. minute, because I think, too, that that young woman who went into the, the housing project may have failed in what she wanted to get done, but she succeeded, perhaps, in at least mm. a raising awareness of the, her yes. issue, yes. And, and who knows what impact she has had on younger children. Right. Who may have seen her, and you know, in in ways that she may not understand. I mean, here she is, a college student. Right. You know, so. people saying, "Wow, <laughs> you know, that's something I can do uh -huh. too. I can go to college." And you know, mm -hmm. they're in a housing project. That that's nothing to feel bad about. That's giving little kids an incentive to go and do what she's doing. So, I mean, she could. There are lots of pieces of that success. She may have failed in the one, her one goal, and I think it's great that she's going back and, and redoing it. But you know, there are lots of other pieces of that mm -hmm. that journey that she took that might have ended up with successes that she doesn't even know. It fits your description of, uh, which is actually, I mean, not quite thought about it this way, but uh, it fits your description of I'm the kind of person who sees something that needs to be fixed and then I want to do it. I want to figure out how to do it. And sometimes you do it and sometimes you don't do it. But the kind of person who notices and then sets out to do it um, is someone who would, I think, have what we call leadership impulses, you know, and then uh, how that develops a lot of other, a lot of other number twos, as you said. Well, and the thing about it is, is once you start going out to get it done, yeah. there are lots of people who will come in behind. They won't take the they won't take the first step, but they will be there. So there's your leadership. You know, that, that reminds me of something else I was actually going to ask you. Mary has planned a program for later this week. Uh, I'm going to have a, she's going to have a panel discussion with a number of people, and the title is um, uh, Women's Leadership, colon, there's always a colon. And the subtitle is Individual, individual mission. mission or Collective Endeavor. Uh, question mark. You know, is it is leadership, women's leadership, about an individual mission or a collective it's endeavor? It's both. Um, I have a feeling the whole panel is going to agree with yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> the the I I remember when I was I stayed home when my children were little, um, and uh, I was at the beach, and our beach place did not have a swimming program, and they also didn't have lifeguards at the bay, and uh, I kind of 
became a little crazed about that and got some other mothers and said, we've got to do something about it. We hired a Red Cross instructor. Some of us took senior life-saving and was drowned. <laughs> but we took it. We all got our, our, our little badges. Um, and we put in place a program. Mm. Now, you know, it was, there was a need. And I said, okay, let's do something about it. And it was all, all of us did. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't do the program all by myself. Yeah, start. because I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. let's do something. But that's, that's the type of thing. So it's not, it's, you really do, I mean, you need the collective mm. movement. Let me ask you about another aspect of that, and this is fast forwarding up to 84. I loved your description in your book, the account of that whole campaign election of Team A. <laughs> the group that yeah, identified buddies. themselves and I they still, were so still still behind your them. back. It was just wonderful. Now, it wasn't that you hadn't thought about being vice president, but they were ahead of you in terms yeah. of all that strategy. And I'm interested both in anything you'd like to say about that group and also whether the fact that 20 years are going to elapse at least before we have another woman on a ticket oh. to say, do we need more Team A's out there? Is Are we missing something? My, my Team A um, were my chief of staff and, and people who were in Washington who had, who had been with me um, from the time I got elected, uh, who had kind of, they were looking at my career with the anticipation that I would eventually end up running for the Senate. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it was. We would sit down for a breakfast or a lunch in the in the members' dining room every couple of months, uh, you know, with my my chief of staff, and um, we would uh, talk about what to do. For instance, when when the Democratic National Committee, uh, well, I can even go back further than that. In the midterm conference in 1982, um, I had. After the 1980 election, mm -hmm. I had seen what damage the 78 midterm conference had had, had on Carter, and uh, and then mm -hmm. saw, you know, what had happened during the convention, and then saw his terrible loss. I vowed at that point that that we had to do something about eliminating the midterm conference, mm -hmm. and I said, after 82, we've got to make sure it's not there, and the 82, we have to make sure that it does not hurt. The Democratic nominee in 1984, mm. and we were successful in the, all those things. So, my team A was very involved in how we strategized that midterm conference. The guys didn't know that we were doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we ended up having panels in Philadelphia, and we ended up having women on all the panels, and we ended up having women's issues being part of. I mean, when they mm -hmm. talked about they wanted to have a separate panel for women, we said, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the economy. Women, women are concerned about the economy. You have to have women talking about about how women are specifically affected within the economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. And when we talked about an environmental panel, we talked about the the result of the environment on women and children, and we did all that stuff. So we had women participating in all the panels because all of those were all of our issues. Um, Team A was very much. I mean, it, I looked like the brilliant one coming out with all these suggestions, but they, you know, this was a, this was. You know, people sitting together and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. helping to shape the dialogue. Um, the same was true with picking the spot on uh, that I could I would request of uh, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee at that time was Chuck Manat, and mm -hmm. we decided that there were three spots that would be terrific for me uh, because I was planning on running for the Senate in '86. Uh, one would be as uh, chair of the platform committee, one would be as chair of the convention, and the third would be as chair of the, uh, of the rules committee, I guess, because I had, when Ella Grasso had, um, had not been able to serve in that position in 1980, I was the deputy and they put me in to chair of the cred uh, credentials committee. Um, so we figured any one of those. And what we did was we figured that platform committee would really be the best, again, this team A mm -hmm. input with this thing, because we figured that that would put me in a position where I would be going all over the country doing hearings, six mm -hmm. hearings, mm -hmm. and so I would get lots of national attention. Oh. I would be meeting with money people from the party, 
and stuff like that, which would be terrific for my my Senate mm -hmm. campaign. And so um, we asked. They said first list uh, chair of the convention, second platform, and third rules because you'll never get the one that you want first. He, Chuck isn't going to give it to you. So I said okay. So we ended up putting chair of the convention first, platform committee, and I got what I wanted, which was platform committee, and it was fabulous. Now they made that decision. So in a lot of ways, they it wasn't it wasn't specifically for this. Uh, when it came to discussing the vice presidency. They thought, you know, there was so much discussion going on about about a woman vice president. And they figured, if they're talking about a woman, why not you? And well, I kept on saying, you're wild. Mm -hmm. Now, there isn't very much you could do um, specifically to get a nomination for vice president. Um, but they were there. They were they were there with, you know, the women's groups. Um, mm -hmm. They were there with labor, uh, with friends in labor. And it's very funny. I mean, the, the friendship that I've had with them has lasted all these years. I was at a, an event in Ohio about a week ago, and someone came up to me and said, I'm a friend of Joe McLean from the, from the uh, 18th. Joe it was just so Ohio. funny. It yeah, Joe it was so <laughs> funny. I mean, and they talk about Millie Jeffrey. I mean, it was yeah. very funny. And yeah. Eleanor, St Eleanor Lewis still, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we when she's in New York, I see her when I'm in uh -huh. Washington. It's, uh -huh. You know, it's amazing. So. We're still friends. It's and, great. you know, when you're describing that, I realize that uh, it's not that different from what men have had. Uh, you hear about these groups, you know, strategizing how to make Ronald Reagan president 20 years right. before he ran or that sort of thing. But it doesn't happen by accident. There, There's yeah. a plan. There's a strategy. You may not have been strategizing or they may not have been for vice president, but as you say, developing a career, a Senate career, and then figuring it out. I yeah. think that story about which committee and how to how to position yourself at the convention is is really very important. Well, it's important on, for people to hear. On the on the committee assignments in Congress, I mean, we sat and we talked about, you know, where would be a good place. And and even my I mean, my first assignments were were totally because of my district totally political. Um, but we talked about I mean, I had an opportunity in 80 to get onto one of the one of the you know special committees and uh -huh. and we talked about it and budget was a wonderful committee for me because I I felt that the budget especially after Ronald Reagan was elected was a definitely a woman's issue and there it wasn't for the politics of it but it was where could I get the most done and so we mm -hmm. talked about that and and I ran out and I didn't run out. I want I got the budget committee um, so a lot of it was strategic and that's really yeah yeah, but what I happens then? let you you raised an issue before mm -hmm. about you know is it going to be twenty years before another twenty years before you're going to see someone on the ticket? No, no. I I think part of it, <laughs> and I, part of the problem. I think that if I think that if Kay Bailey Hutchinson were not from Texas, I think she would have been on the ticket with George W. Bush, mm -hmm. um, because she had all the things she, he needed. She was. She is as conservative as he. Mm -hmm. She is knowledgeable on, you know, on certainly on on foreign policy, which she was not. Uh, she is, you know, an expert on what's going on in the Senate because she's been a member for God knows what two terms already. Mm -hmm. um, and and Christy Todd Whitman was too liberal to be on the national ticket. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, the conservative. I mean, the people who who were going to elect him would not have been happy with the Christie Todd Whitman. So I, you know, and, but it, it had to be a different statement constitutionally. Sure. Um, I think she would have been on that ticket. Mm -hmm. um, now, will someone run in, eight, in 2004? Nobody on the Republican side, obviously, is going to challenge George W. Will a Democrat run? I, I don't think so. But I do think in 2008, um, unless a Democrat gets elected in 2004, that you're going to see. I think you'll see Hillary running. Mm -hmm. um, there are other Democratic women in the House, but there are two things that you need. You need, you need not only um, the spot, which is why, you know, K. B. L. Hutchinson won't run in 2004, but I do think she's going to run in 2008 as well mm -hmm. on the Republican side. But you also need to have the desire to do it. Yeah. 
And I just don't see any of the Democratic women besides Hillary who really wants to do it. I mean, Barbara Mikulski is one of my closest friends. And, and there's no way that she wants to do it. I mean, she, she kids. She says that I got the nomination because I'm like four inches tall than she is, or three <laughs> inches tall. And, and she's funny as anything. She's my closest friend. Um, but, but she would no more want to do this for national office. This is mm -hmm. not her thing. She loves the Senate, and she's so effective. And she loves her people in Maryland. I mean, these mm -hmm. are her, these are, I mean, everybody's a, a hugger there. I mean, they all love her. So it's, um, well, you she know, doesn't want to do what that. What it speaks to is, because, because one could go through the list, as you mentioned before, 13 women in the Senate. There are five women governors now. So we have, there are 18 people, and those are the, obvious feeder offices. That, that's the universe if you're in not, which That's turn. right. So then you can go through the list and say, well, this one really isn't interested, and this one, there are a lot. And when you have a very small group like that, only a universe of, from those two positions of 18 people, it's a very small group. So the chances you're going to produce 10 people who want to run for president. It's not going to happen. No. And that's partly why it's taking so long, though I agree with you entirely that Hillary Rodham Clinton is a person who is so obvious uh, because she's got the whole combination. And, 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 and she uh, will be in her second term and she, yeah. by uh -huh. 2000. Yeah. But the, the, other, the other thing that I, I, I find fascinating is that I think there's a real difference with how women approach this and how men do. Men, when they get elected to the Senate, I mean, the next day they're running for president. I mean, it's just the most amazing. They wake up the next morning and say, I'm presidential material. <laughs> Women sit there when they get elected and they say, okay, I've got to do this job. I really want to do it. Right. I mean, we, we take a look at the job that we're going to take it seriously. I, I get, I, I, it tickles me when I see some of these guys who have been in, you know, like six months and they're already running for president. And you turn around and you say, okay, guys. You know, take a deep breath and mm -hmm. get your job done that you've got. You know. But the flip side of that is, will we get enough women? Because the women take those jobs so seriously, and they tell themselves they have to take longer to learn them and all. And so that becomes part of the reason why there are so few women. I worry about that. No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think women think that they take longer than men to learn them. I think they understand that um, that... I think women kind of feel that the voters have gone out and put their mm -hmm. trust in them, and and it's it's pay that trust mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. uh, with devotion to the job that you've got. Mm -hmm. um, don't let your ambition, you know, get in the way. I mean, people presume, uh, for instance, with Hillary when she got elected, people presumed that she was going to dive into you know the presidential mm -hmm. race. I mean. Hillary is a very smart woman. Yeah. She's got time. And would she be a fabulous president? I think she will. Mm -hmm. You notice I say she will. I <laughs> says she would. I think she will be. And I, but I do think she is absolutely right spending the first six years, I think she owes that to the people of this mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. And by 2008, she'll be in that second term, and she wants to run. Run. So are you, Geraldine Ferraro, predicting that the first woman president of the United States will be Hillary Rodham Clinton? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm telling you, I sure hope so. I mean, <laughs> I want to be there. I really do. This state has produced some wonderful uh, things. I mean, look at yes. look at Seneca Falls, for goodness mm -hmm. sakes. If it wasn't for Elizabeth Cady Stanton and it Susan B. Anthony. I mean, these are all New Yorkers. That's right. <laughs> so she found she had to first find her New York, and yes, then and she's a New Yorker. Prepare herself to move very out of much New York a New Yorker. Into, into that. Yeah, and there's something about it. I think those of us who watch this closely and have watched—I don't mean her. I mean women in politics. It seems so obvious to me that um, there are some people you can say, well, that's not going to happen for whatever reason. Doesn't mean they're not great. Doesn't mean they're not doing a Olympia wonderful Snow job in the Senate. Olympia Snow is right. one person. I love Olympia. Right. I serve with her, a Republican. But I, in a million years, I can't imagine they should ever say, yeah, yeah let me go. I'm going to run. Uh -huh. right. mm -hmm. um, now, some of the others, Mary Landrieu, I think, with time also, mm -hmm. I think she's a potential. I think a whole bunch of other women, uh, you know, in the Senate are in a position where they could do it. Do you think George W. Bush would consider he's going to have to put a, presumably, another vice presidential candidate on the ticket next time? And as you point out, it can't be Kay Bailey Hutchison. Do you think there's any chance it would be Condoleezza Rice? Possibly. I mean, 
especially if, if we're still, you know, at war on terrorism, which I assume we will be, and especially if, um, if we, uh, you know, if, if that's the main issue. Um, I think it, I mean, she's, she's certainly a credible person, and if you take a look at the fact that the Hispanic vote in this country is a very large vote, um, growing larger each day, uh, and certainly a vote that people are anxious to, to hook into, um, I think, you know, sure it's a possibility. Flip side of that is, what does he get from it? Um, is she a leader in the political sense? Uh, not really. Um, does I don't know her views on any of the issues that that women are concerned about. Women are not generally, you know, involved as much in the defense issues, uh, military issues, and there she is an absolute expert. Um, does he benefit from having her on the ticket or still having her as his right-hand person? Yeah. You know, I mean, those are yeah, things okay. that he'll have to sit down and figure out. Um, you know, where, you, where's the is, benefit? This is one of those crazy questions, because I, I know there's no answer to it, but <laughs> then you're going to ask it again. Yeah, <laughs> it's just because, you know, it's the sort of thing that buzzes around in one's head, but because you just raised, uh, say, women are not as involved with or haven't traditionally been with the defense issues and those. Or in some fantasy, perceived. yeah, perceived. in some fantasy of women in the major leadership positions in this country and maybe in some others, uh, would we know how to solve this incredible, terrible, frightening, horrible mess in the Middle East that threatens to bring us all down? Could we do something different? I mean, it is only men who are Well, involved. actually, Condoleezza Rice has been involved she, with that, too. Is. But you know what? We had we had Madeleine Albright in in one of the the most powerful mm -hmm. positions in this country. She did a magnificent job as Secretary of State. There's nothing genetic about this thing. But but if you take a look at women voters, women when they go to vote are not voting on the military issues. They're voting on whether or not their kids are getting an education. They're voting on whether or not their kids are going to have enough food if they live in a decent house. Those those are the issues that a lot of women are voting on. They're not so much voting on, you know, on, mm -hmm. on military issues, on military budgets. Uh, you know, that's, that's generally not where we're going, unless, of course, you're at war, then it's a different thing. But um, uh, I just, I think when push comes to shove with voters, if they look at someone who is um, on a ticket, um, they're gonna look for someone who is gonna be able to address the issues that, that are concerned. And, we're the ones who are talking about health care. We're the ones who are pushing for, you know, for coverage, drug coverage. I mean, the guys are too, but we're the ones up front on this stuff mm -hmm. because under Medicare for drugs, because you turn around and you're, you're looking at your mother and your father, and you're the one who's, you know, taking care of them, and you're saying, dear God, I mean, they, they're not going to make it if they can't get drug coverage from Medicare on this stuff. So women will tend to vote on those issues. It's not that you don't understand them, and not that you don't expect your leaders to understand them, and not that you couldn't have confidence in a woman who is an expert on military issues. I mean, to understand, so I didn't want, I don't want to get the wrong, give the wrong impression no, on that. No, no. Yeah. I, you know, what it reminded me of actually, just as you were saying this was, I was in the audience when you did your famous uh. debate with uh, that was actually a big experience for yeah. me, not only because it was so wonderful to see you up there debating um, then Vice President George Bush, uh, but also because it was the first time I'd been in the audience of a national vice presidential or presidential debate, and then I wasn't naive, but boy was I shocked when the coverage came out the next day because amazing. I walked out of there and I knew that you won. Yeah, and then yes. I watched yeah. the coverage. Then but you know what? The interesting thing was experience. that at that time, the reporters were all white male. Mm -hmm. They were all. There were very few women who were anchoring. There were very few women who were, who were participating in the discussion uh, as reporters. And so when it came out, they were the ones 
who made the decision. Yeah, and they play that uh, coverage of debates. I know some reporters have called me after debates, and, you know, it's just there's so much pressure to not, as far as I can tell, never to say anyone won, um, but always to say, well, it was a toss-up. Uh, and but I, it's, it's gone. It, it, has, it has moved now, I think, that we haven't had any women in the debates yet, in the national debate yeah. since. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, mm -hmm. but I do think um, that now you do get other views as well. You get, now there are more women after the 84 yeah. campaign, now yeah. part, of the, part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. What about in general? Have, has the double standard for women uh, in situations like that and just generally, has it become less onerous for women? Um, is, it, is it easier with the media? Is it easier with their colleagues? Um, I remember the wonderful account that you gave at the time that you were named to be uh, the vice presidential candidate about who was briefing you on the status of foreign affairs and so forth. And were you getting the same briefing uh, that Fritz Mondale was getting and were you getting the same people? And I think a lot of women are asking themselves now because things have changed. It's not so blatant. It's not so obvious. They don't quite know when something comes zinging past yeah. them. Was that sexist or is that just the way things are now? Um, um, I think it's, I think it's, I think there'll always be a double standard. Um, I think part of it is, is um, that women, uh, women kind of do it to themselves too. We, we kind of demand more of ourselves and, and, uh, and we've got to, in many instances, be better in order to show that we're as good. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but, but it's not only, but it, I don't think it's as much yeah. now as it was in 84. And I do think it's not as much coming from the media now because you have because you have so many women yes. now who are part of the media. Mm -hmm. You also, it's not as much coming from the Congress now either because the numbers are better. I mean, once you get a bigger um, group of people on your side, the, the yes. standards mm -hmm. change, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the dynamics change and so Jerry, it's better. you have been so wonderful and generous. I'd love to go on forever and we're winding down. I want to ask you a fast closing question. It's a big one, but a, I need a fast answer. Mm -hmm. You've got two daughters and a son, all grown up now, and I know you've got grandchildren. Are your daughters living different lives because of what you and the other women leaders who came out of the 70s and into this whole period we've been describing experienced and did? Um, I, I don't, my younger daughter perhaps, my, I mean they're all, they're all married. Mm -hmm. um, the two girls, um, both are professionals. Um, the, the one thing they've gotten out of it is, is that, you know, they can do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, they can, and I'll, I'll give you a, a little story. Laura, the youngest, went to college, graduated, was a graphic designer. After two years of working, three years of working, called us up and said, I always want to be a doctor. Went back to, well, we said, why don't you mention that while you were in college? <laughs> she went back to school, got her basic credits, went to medical school, did the medical school. I, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know if she would have done that if she were not part of the campaign thing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know. Let me try this because this is something I really want and let me go for it. I don't know if she would have turned around and said, my time has passed. I mean, I can remember her looking at me with all the jobs I've had and she said, what are you going to be when you grow up? Uh -huh. I mean, you know, even at this age, you know, I, I think that's one of the things that I've said to them, you know. If so you know. like, so you, like your mother, became the example. Well, and, and my daughter. older daughter, too, uh, who was who a producer for the Today Show, quit and is now into independent production. Risk, uh, take uh -huh. a risk, and, you know, go because that's what she really wants to do. So yeah, I guess in some ways they, they learn from the campaign. From their mother.
Thank you, Jerry. Thank, Thank you. you so Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs>